All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We pray and ask that you speak to us. Let your word be uh, an inspiration to us. Let your word sanctify us. Let your word renew our mind and let your word transform our lives. We thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Today, we'll be looking at uh, another image of the church. Today, we'll be talking about the members of the community. We'll be looking through a little bit through John chapter 10, where Jesus says that he is our shepherd, okay? Um, you see, last week we were saying that there, there is not really a definition given in the Bible about what the church is. We do define the church today, but the Bible describes the church and gives us pictures about the church. And there are so many pictures that describes the church. And it's all important because different pictures describes different aspects of the church. Last week, we see that the church is the family of God. Everybody say family. That's why we are brothers and sisters. That's why in the kingdom of God, we also believe that they are now grandchildren. Yeah, what part of the prayer that we pray for the children, that they too will know God as their own God. They will be our brothers and sisters because we are all sons and daughters of God. Amen? Amen. Today we'll be looking at a different picture, which is the picture of a flock. Of a flock. If you look at the seven pictures that I put there. There are 96 according to Paul Minier who did a research on it. Um, but I took out out of the 96, seven most repeated pictures of the church and we want to look at different aspects of the church through these seven pictures. Last week we saw family. This week we're going to focus on the flock of God. I'm not going to ask you to bar bar black sheep, right? Uh, but we are all Sheep. <laughs> you see, uh, when Jesus called us his sheep, it was not a compliment. Um, I know we are not farmers. I know we don't take care of animals, right? Uh, probably Ellen take care of horses. Uh, but none of us have much experience with gambing. If you want to see this kind of lamb, you can go to Travelers Inn, I think, last time. They used to have this. Is it still there? The lamb? The sheep, do you see that before? No, huh? they look pretty ugly if they're in Malaysia. Now, let me, let me tell you a little bit about this animal that we call sheep. Huh? In, our, in our mental picture, sheep is clean, beautiful. You know? My daughter, the youngest one, you see just now, she was holding a little sheep in her hand. She loves the sheep. She cannot sleep without it. One of her favorite songs is Baba Black Sheep. Baba Black Sheep, have you any wool, right? And... The thing is, when we look at the, the part where the animal is, this animal, this sheep, is very vulnerable. Um, it's, it's, it, it cannot find its own food. Sheep cannot find its own water, cannot find its own food. That's why they need a shepherd. In, in fact, I was trying to read up. Today, sheep cannot survive without a shepherd. It's that bad. It's that vulnerable, that clueless, that clumsy. It just cannot live without a shepherd taking care of it. Do you also know that sheep is very defenseless against any predators, you know? Whenever some animals come and attack them, you know, some other animals, you see they have defense, you know, some herbivores, they will gather in a circle, they will guard one another, right? Or some of them will have some defense where they run up the trees. They, they, they all have some defense mechanism. The ship has none. The ship has none. It cannot defend itself. There is no protection. When they see something, they run. And they can only escape, you know. None of them says, okay, let's stand together. United we stand. There's no such thing with the ship. They say bye-bye, you know. They say, eh, they go go themselves first. And another thing about the sheep is they are, they are instinctively, for, they, they are built like that. I, I don't know why. They are made such that they always follow the sheep in front. 
if you imagine if so happened that they are eating together, right? And one sheep decided to walk off, the next sheep will follow. Don't know why. And so uh, I was searching around. A few years back, this upper right corner, this was in UK, right? UK. One single sheep was being attacked, right? Uh, I think it was a bear. Was it a bear? I forgot by what. And all 206 sheep got so frightened, they ran and all of them ran over the cliff. All died. The predator that only eat one single lamb, every, everybody else run off. Because what happened is when the guy is running in front, everybody says, let's follow. They have this crowd mentality, right? And they follow. When the guy jumped off the cliff, the rest decided it must be fun. Let's do it. So they all did. Wow. And lastly, the sheep has no way to groom himself. This guy, lower right, is lost in New Zealand for a few years, I think. When they found him, <laughs> that's how he looked like. <laughs> they have nowhere to cut his own hair, you know. Uh, when they shave him off, his entire wool, uh, what do you call it, wool, right, was 35 kilo, 36 kilogram. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> so this animal cannot even take care of himself. In fact, uh, this one a bit gross, but Sonia was telling me, that when a cow bangsai, uh, poo, okay, does its business, the tail will go up, right? And uh, the poo will come out, okay? But when a sheep will bangsai, uh, sorry, poo, the, the tail just stay like that. It doesn't like, okay, let's make way for it. So everything hits the tail and drips off. I'm like, what type of animal does that, you know? So I think that's why when you see pictures, they actually have their tail cut off. That's why it's nice and short. That's why. Also, they have no defense against parasites. One of the, uh, their nose is where the, the insects like to come and lay eggs. And they have nowhere to chase away all these flies or insects. You know, like the cow, their tail can like help them shoo away the lalat, the, the, the fly. A sheep can do nothing. And Jesus says, I am the shepherd and I take care of my sheep. Because it's bringing something for us in this picture. Now for them, they understood clearly in that time. For us today, I have to describe a little bit more. And now we understand that the picture describes the grave need we have of a shepherd. In fact, a sheep will not survive without our shepherd. So I'm going to bring to you three points through John chapter 10. Let's next slide. The image brings forth this beautiful picture about our good shepherd, our chief shepherd, our great shepherd, right? But it also tells us a lot of elements which we'll go through one by one uh, slowly and we will learn more about our need and how we are to respond to God, okay? Turn with me to John chapter 10. I will not read the whole passage again. Um, you can read that at home. It'll be a very interesting passage. John chapter 10, verse 1 to verse 18. It says that Jesus is the true shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. Now, next slide. Now, the first thing we want to uh, identify today is that Jesus is our shepherd and we are his sheep. Therefore, number one, we need to follow Christ Jesus. Now, why? You see, when Jesus is our good shepherd, what does a shepherd do for his sheep? His flock. And in John chapter 10, we see there are three elements. The shepherd lead, the shepherd feed, and the shepherd protect. Let me repeat that. A shepherd lead, a shepherd feed, and a shepherd protects. And you, you see why, you see? Sheep, number one, just now I told you, cannot find its own food. Cannot follow one. It's just anything, seeing anywhere, they want to run off, they run off. They see a sheep go off, they follow. And therefore, they need a shepherd to guide them, to lead them. That's why the shepherd goes in front. And I don't know what type of voices they say. Because Jesus says, I call them by name, you know. I don't know whether he calls each sheep by name. 
But like a horse, you have a certain sound, like a cow, like a buffalo. You, you make a certain sound and animals follow. So I have no idea what type of sound a shepherd does. But basically, when the shepherd moves in front, the sheep follow. Okay, they know, th they are quite brilliant, I think. They know which one is the shepherd. They can hear the voice out of so many different shepherds. That's mine. So they follow. And Jesus is our good shepherd and he leads us. And where does he lead us to? He leads us to still waters and green pastures. Obviously, in Israel, green pastures don't look so green to me. But without the shepherd leading them to places with food, they will probably starve. And as sheep, we need food. And Jesus leads us to the place to drink that's safe, leads us to the place to eat and feed. And what else does a shepherd do? A shepherd protects. You remember King David? He says, King David says that when the bear comes, he stand his ground and he fight the bear. When the lions come, he stood his ground and he fought. And Jesus says he's a good shepherd. He's not a hireling. When savage animals come and attack a hireling, a person who not his sheep, he will run. He says, ah, get someone else to help, right? He just take care of the sheep. When there is a need for protection, he can't do it. But a shepherd will lay down his life. And that's what Jesus said. He will lay down his life for the sheep. Wow. Wow. And Jesus did for us, isn't it? And this is the picture. That Christ, our good shepherd, leads us, feeds us, and protects us. And if Jesus is our good shepherd, and he leads, he feeds, and we protect, what do we need to do as sheep? Next slide. Very simple, right? When Jesus leads, we follow. Now in verse, I think, verse what already? Uh? It's in the same passage. I should have put the verse in. Basically, it, Jesus says that my sheep knows my voice. Huh? We can hear God's voice and we can follow. When God leads us, when God leads us, we have a decision to make. Do we follow and trust Him? Do we obey and love Him? Or do we decide to do our own things? Sometimes in life, we find a struggle when it comes to that. You see, it has nothing to do with the family part. We know as a son of God, as a family of God, that part, our identity is secured. My question is, as the flock of God, as the sheep of God, what do I do now? Do I trust Him? Do I yield to Him? And sometimes it's difficult. I admit that. But I encourage you to obey Him. To obey Him. Amen? Amen. When He feeds us with the Word of God today, when He feeds us, what do we do? We need to... Chew and digest. There was a word that recently told to me. Ruminate. You need to ruminate the word of God. You see, basically, it, it's this. We can listen to a sermon and it just flow over our head. Hey, finish the sermon already. Time for lunch. You see, when the word of God is being given, it is our own responsibility to chew and eat. And on Sunday, it's a feast, right? On Sunday, it's a feast because we have the preaching of the Word of God. But you don't only eat one meal a week. Just one week, meal a week is not enough, isn't it? We need, to, we need to eat the Word of God daily. Maybe you have a smaller meal, you know? Not every day you have a feast, one-hour sermon. Not every day you can have long hours studying the Word of God. But you can have a sip of milk. You can have a bite of a bread. You can have a small chew of the food and you partake nutrients into your body because the Word of God makes us strong. And we need to take it as, as much as possible. Now, some may ask that how often do I need? As often as you need then. It's like eating, right? It's like eating. In some countries, I find out they eat one meal a day. They eat one meal a day and they are, they are very satisfied. Uh, first time I met a person like that was in JB. I was talking to a stranger in a Kedai Kopi. I said, oh, where are you from? He says, 
I forgot where he says it's from now. So I says, oh, you are eating, yeah, I'm having my, my first uh, my meal. I say, oh, you had your breakfast? No, I don't eat breakfast. He, he eats lunch, one meal a day, and he's so full. I say, you don't eat dinner? He says, I'm so full, I can't eat anything else until tomorrow lunch. So I'm very impressed, you know? I'm very impressed. But some people like us, we eat three meals a day. Uh, if you don't eat three meals a day, you feel very hungry, very, wow, oh, samsara. But I know of other people who need to eat six meals a day. Right? Uh, people who need to eat six meals a day, maybe they feel that if they don't have six meals, they can't, they can't go through the day. And I know of people who eat the extreme most, one meal a day that starts the day they wake up and until the time they sleep, they eat continuously throughout the day. Now, when it comes to the Word of God, different people may have different diet. But my encouragement for you is this. God can bring you to the food. He can provide you your food but it is our responsibility to open our mouth and eat it. So let's chew. Let's eat. Let's enjoy our meal. How many of you love eating? Yeah, if I ask you favorite food, everybody start getting excited, right? Uh, I asked Jesse favorite food, he got very quiet. Asians love food. May the same love we have for food be similar to our love for our spiritual food. May we increase to have more love for the Word of God in our life. Not just Sunday. Sunday is feasting time, all right? We, we, we eat a lot. But other days as well. It is our responsibility to eat the food that God brings to us. And number three, when God protects us, right? When God protects us, what do we do? Now, when we are being attacked by the, the predators, right? When the bear comes, when the lions come, and the shepherd is standing there, what does the sheep do? You stand behind the shepherd, yes? You don't need to go like, hey, you know what? I'm going to run away, <laughs> you know? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we feel that we know more than God. And we feel that God don't understand us. In some situations, we feel that I know more than God, God don't understand. Therefore, I will live my own life. Have you heard of this very old song? It's my life, it's now or never. Now we don't sing that song, but we say YOLO, right? You only live once. Yeah, let's live our life as I want it to be. But for us to be protected to God, we must learn to be abiding in Him and submitting to Him. If I don't follow Jesus, I don't stand behind Him, I get myself into troubles, isn't it? In fact, in our life, we have seen, we have experienced, we have made mistakes, because we do our own way, we get ourselves into trouble. And then God has to come rescue us. We have experienced that. But that's the thing about our responsibility as a sheep. We must stand under God's protection. Amen? And that's why it's so important to have the community. I entitled my sermon today, Members of the Community. Why? Because we are together. <clears throat> All right? And it is important then to live within a community because in a community, we not only have Jesus, our Savior, we have brothers and sisters. Now, before I talk about our one another, our brothers and sisters, I want to talk a little bit about leadership. Leadership is like this dog. Sometimes we call our leaders our pastor, yeah? We are so used to it, we call all leaders pastor. But do you know, in the Bible, what? Aircon is back? Wow, how did they do that? Praise God. Now, do you know, in the Bible, the word shepherd can mean noun or verb. The word shepherd can mean an action, means you shepherd the sheep, or it can be a name, a noun, the name you call somebody. I repeat that, huh? Uh, let them do that first because we are distracted. But this, I feel this is quite important um, to identify the action and the name. The reason because leaders are called to shepherd. Somebody say amen. Leaders are called to shepherd. I am called to shepherd the flock of God. But I am called to action verb shepherd the family of God. 
But do you know, out of all the names, the nouns, shepherd, most of the shepherd are used for Jesus. Some are for real occupational shepherd. Only one time, only one single time, the word shepherd is used for a leader. Only one single time. Every other time, it was meant as an action. The reality is this. The reality is leaders are not shepherds. Leaders are called to do the work of a shepherd. In other words, we are all sheep. Leaders are sheep. We only have one shepherd. Leaders are sheep that shepherds. Let me say that again. Leaders are not shepherds. Leaders are sheep that shepherd. The only time the word pastor is used for a person is in the list of gifting, the gifts of equippers, which we talked about previously. The reason shepherds equip the church to shepherd is because we are all called to shepherd. We'll talk about it later on. But for now, yes, leaders need to shepherd. The word of God is very clear. The Word of God has asked leaders to do the work of shepherds. But we must understand, especially for leaders, we must understand that we are not shepherds. We are not leaders. That's why in the Bible, it talks about servant leadership. We don't stand up high, but leaders stand together as a family. We are equal with one another. The only difference is our calling and gifting. We are called to do the work of a shepherd. And what do leaders do as shepherds? You know, in the work of shepherds, what do a leader do? Very simple. A leader is supposed to lead, feed, protect. Just as Jesus, our shepherd, lead in John chapter 10, feed and protect, leaders today do the same work. They lead, they feed, they protect. How do they lead? The Bible tells us leaders lead by example. I repeat that. Leaders lead by example. If I want this in our life, I will leave it and let's leave it out together. That's why Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. When I first read that verse, I feel Paul is heretic, you know. You want me to imitate man? I want to imitate God, you know? I feel like this. I don't want to imitate man because man is imperfect. Paul has his own weaknesses, but Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ because repeatedly it shows that leaders lead. They do lead, but they lead by example. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees. Why? Jesus rebuked the Pharisees not because they are Bad, uh, they're teaching uh, bad things, but because they didn't leave the things they teach. Uh, let, let's look at it. Matthew chapter 23. Um, what verse? Uh? Okay, verse 1. Right. Matthew chapter 23. It says, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, verse 2, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Sorry, I don't have a slide for this. Moses sleep. They are sitting in the seat of leadership. They are the leaders of the congregation. They are the leaders of the nation of Israel. And Jesus acknowledged that. Scribes, Pharisees, they are leaders. But verse 3, Therefore, whatever, whatever they tell you to observe, that you observe and do. Jesus says this, you know. Whatever the Pharisees says to do, do it. Do but do not do according to their works because they say and do not do. What the Pharisees taught was great, but they are hypocrites because they teach one thing, they do another. And leaders lead not just by telling you what to do, but by leading by example. Maybe you're a leader of a cell group. Maybe you're a leader of a team. Maybe you are a leader in your workplace. Maybe you are a leader in your family. Maybe you are a leader in your business. Maybe you are a leader in your community. 
wherever you stand as a leader, may we all as leaders lead by example. Because Asian's culture is such that do what I say, don't do what I do. We hear that a lot. You know, a long time ago, they say, do what I say, don't do what I do. Let's reject that. May we be leaders in our family that will do what we say. That's why it's becoming difficult to parent our children because when we say something and then our children say, Papa, do one. <laughs> right? Huh? Let's not scold them for saying that. Let's change ourselves that we may lead by example. If we believe certain things, may it be reflected in our life. Amen? Amen? If we love the Word of God, let's reflect it. If we love God, let's reflect it. If we love people, let's reflect it. If we believe in the fruit of the Spirit to be developed in our life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, let's develop it. Let's show it. I know it's difficult because it become like a, like a, a very transparent before people, but that's good. That's good because we are not perfect. We are progressing. Amen? Amen? So that's what leaders do. They lead by example. And number two, they feed with the Word of God. We don't feed with uh, food. <laughs> Sometimes we do. But the important thing is we need to feed. But the thing is, let's say I preach on Sunday. I preach on Sunday. I can prepare the food. I can prepare the Word. I can prepare the preaching. I can prepare the sermon. But it's still up to you if you want to take it in and digest and think about it. To ruminate, it says. To digest and think. That's why you have cell group, right? People will ask you questions. That's why you have family, people who will check on one another because we need to take up the responsibility to it. Number three, we protect from savage wolves. The context of savage wolves is not animals. The context of savage wolves is wrong teachings, wrong doctrine, wrong guidance, wrong direction. You see, when we are young in our Christian life, we may not have enough time to learn the Bible. Yeah, well, there's a lot of things in the Bible. Oh, there's a lot of things in the Bible we don't know. But because we don't know, it's easy to, to cheat us. And that's where we have godly leaders in our life. We have people in our life who can help us with questions. One of the important things we need to develop in church is the freedom to ask questions especially for children. Children got lots of questions and they annoy me so much sometimes with questions. But asking questions allow them to discover and learn. Do you know people don't learn with listening to lectures? I know because I'm a teacher last time. Right? People learn when you ask them questions. People learn when they ask questions. I find that one of the greatest things in Bible study, in small group Bible study, is the room and opportunity where I can ask them questions. You know, when you sometimes, how, how many of you try to teach someone and they don't want to listen to you? Yes? You experienced that before? No? You, you want to teach them, they don't want to listen. So what do you do? I was, shout loud, loud. <laughs> shout louder. Yeah, that's what we do last time. Shout out, listen to me. Then you repeat and I repeat and I repeat and they still don't get me. I, I find somebody taught me this. They say when they don't want to listen, you ask questions. You keep on asking questions because you will find that a lot of the things we want to teach, they know already. That's why they don't want to listen. Boring. So when you ask questions, you will ask until a point where they don't know. You ask until a point where finally that part they don't know, we explain the part they don't know. The few times... I, I like monologue, you know, preaching, one person talk is quite nice also. But I tried a few times with a dialogue and I asked them questions. Well, I find quite good. It makes learning more fun and more relevant with the people. And may we do that to one another. Huh? Amen. So leaders lead by example, leaders feed with the word of God, leaders protect from wrong teachings, wrong doctrines. And what's the doctrine? Very easy. You have your Bible with you? Everything written in the Word of God is the doctrine. Everything else is human interpretation of that doctrine. 
The Bible is the Word of God. Nothing else. The Bible is the Word of God. And so we judge everything else based on the Word of God, what's written on it. And sometimes we hope the Bible to be a certain way. For example, for me, I love textbooks. I like it to be very organized. Point one, point two, point three, point four. You know, when you want to study the Word of God, sometimes very math, very difficult. You see here, you don't understand. You have to find another verse so that the verse explains that verse. You, you see that before? Because the Bible is not a textbook. I wish the Bible is a textbook. Some people wish that the Bible is a historical narrative. It just tells history. It doesn't. Bible miss out a lot of things about history and put in a lot of effort in certain portions of history. Why? Because the Bible is not a history book. Bible is not a systematic theology book as well. I wish it can put in chapter 1, love. Chapter 2, justice. Chapter 3, you know, you don't have to flip here, flip there. Everything is properly. It's not. The Bible is given to you and I as the truth of God that sanctifies our life, challenges our mindset and worldviews, and impact the way we live our life in our behavior, in our trust, in our obedience. Probably that's why the Bible is written like that. There is no book like the Word of God. Other books are written for inspirational purpose. Some other books are written for information purpose. A Bible is a mixture so that you and I can learn from it. Wow. Wow. But we struggle sometimes, especially when we come to it and we hope that it's a textbook. You know, uh, I think it was some, somebody asked me, why are uh, the book of Paul uh, so hard to understand? You cannot make it simple or not. I think that's the beauty of the Word of God. It's meant for such a way that it can benefit a young Christian and a mature Christian at the same time. Wow. I don't know how God does it, but the Word of God is the Word of God. And so how do we respond? As the flock of God, as a church, how do we respond to leaders around us? When they lead us, let's follow and imitate them. I'm not just saying pastors and leaders. I'm saying every Christian leaders in our life within the church. When they lead by example, we learn from them. We see how they live. Now, the, the thing is this. When we imitate somebody, sometimes we expect them to be perfect. How many of you knows there are no perfect Christians? Yeah? No matter how perfect your leader is, sooner or later, they disappoint you, Kao Kao. The only reason they were perfect last time because you were very, very far from them. <laughs> Once you get closer to them, you see more of their life. Oh, okay. Humans are not perfect, but we follow them imitating because they are imperfect. In their weakness, they trust God. Let's imitate. In their failure, they repent. Let's imitate. All these things, stories of failures and disasters and bad decisions in life are good to learn from. It's just terrible to tell. Recently, I was having a small little group and I was telling them my mistakes I did. Oh, after that night, I feel so terrible after the meeting ended. But I know that I needed to share so that they can learn from my mistakes. But it's humiliating. Like, oh, you just tell people what you do wrong, you know, tell people what you do, the mistakes you do. We like to tell people the things we do right. But you see, we need to start telling them the things we do wrong because when we are not perfect, we are saying you too can do it because you and I are the same. We are the same. You know, when I deal with youths, right, teenagers, a lot of times youths feel that there's a communication gap with adults. It's because adults are so strong, they are so perfect, they are so, they are just up in the, in the heavens. Lah. Adults are great. They say the right things. They do the right things. They act the right things. Their timing is right. They are 
Everything is perfect. And as teenagers, they struggle because they always gonna mara. You don't know, man. Don't do this now. Do this later. Everything they do is wrong. And sometimes it's difficult because you cannot achieve that perfection for them. But when adults show them that, you know what? I too make mistakes. It gives them a glimmer of hope that if I make mistakes, it's okay for them to make mistakes too. And the reality is we do make mistakes. We just don't tell about the mistakes we did. And may we as a community of God, let's be more transparent and vulnerable in our stories. Now, I understand we may not want to come on stage and tell everybody, you know what, I do mistakes. Okay, lah, maybe hard. We, but we have small little groups. We have small groups of good friends that we can share. We can talk about issues that we are struggling with. And it's helpful. Because I assure you, in a group of 10, when you share one problem, eight of them have the same problem as you. Any problem you share. It's just that we never say but the Bible tells us all the same, right? All the same. Every one of us has the same mistake. Okay. And so we follow my imitating and we also need to learn to self-feeding. Not just depend on... No, when we're young Christian, we depend on preaching. We listen to sermons. We listen to cassettes. We listen to videos. Now we listen to YouTube. We listen to podcasts. But they must reach a time where you need to just have nothing but the Word of God. They will reach, they will reach a time in your life you will have nothing, forget about sermons, forget about commentaries, forget about, put that all aside and just bring the Bible to God and says, God, teach me. The Bible tells us that you don't need a teacher because the Holy Spirit is your teacher. You have the Word of God in your hands. God will teach you. God will teach you. And then the, you will notice the things you learn by yourself, in reality, we never learn by ourselves, but you know my the things we find out and learn by ourselves, we become so excited because that's so firsthand. And we all need that. Another way to surf it is when you sit down and you discuss. That's why we begin to, a few years back, begin to change the cell group style. We no longer want people to preach. We say, let's have some discussion. Why? Because we, we are human beings. We don't quite like to listen. We like to talk, yes? You No? Okay, we would like to talk. Now, Sunday service, boring lah. Only pastor one person talk all day, you know. Everyone sit there uh, trying their best to keep their eyes open. But when in discussion time, you get to share and you get to listen to different opinions and you get to question like, like eh? And that's where you begin to learn because when you have questions, you need answers. You need answers. The Word of God will give you an answer. I pray that you will find your answer in the Word of God because sometimes it's easier to find your answers on Google. It takes way faster but may not be the answer you should come to. Maybe you should take the time to struggle with it a little bit more. It may take one week. It may take one month. It may take one year. It may take 10 years. Let's grapple and work it out because God is in us. The same Spirit of God is in all of us. Amen? The same Word is in all our hands. And therefore, let's learn from God. Let's learn to self-fit. But the third one is very important. You see, in our culture, we have this idea where we don't want to talk about personal issues. You say, um, this is my life. There's a line. I know you are my church friends, but you don't cross this line. If you cross this line, I will change church. You see, the thing is, when he talks about a community, iron sharpens iron, right? Iron sharpens iron. So to sharpen two iron, the iron, when it's being asa, both gets sharp. But the thing is, it does not feel good. Amen? When you are in your cell group, are there misunderstandings? Are there conflicts? Are there times when you're angry with one another? Sometimes we don't deal with it and we are angry with one another for life. We'll always be, smile when I meet you on Sunday, don't want to see you any other day. I, 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 this one. The thing is this, 
These kind of situations are good for us. But we need to learn to embrace each other and to work things out. Now, that is counterculture. Our culture don't like to work things out. I love to sweep things under the carpet. But that is the worst way to deal with a conflict. Because when you sweep under the carpet, problems get bigger. When the first time I talked to Salome after we got married, like we got issue, we are fighting about, I forgot what we fight about, but I was fighting with Salome. And as usual, when I'm angry, I sweep under the carpet and I pretend it's not there. So Salome, poor girl, no idea that I was ever angry. No idea something happened. No idea that I was upset with this issue. So it happens again. The same issue happened again. I sweep under the carpet again. It happens again. I hide it again. It happens again. I pretend I don't see it again. I thought that was love. Every time it happens, I push it aside. But it got to a point where cannot tahan all. Why you never change one? Obviously, because I never told her, right? But in my heart, why you don't know me? Need me to tell one. Ah. You know, in the heart. You cannot change. Ah. You know, I, I feel upset and it comes to a point where I oh, easily agitated. Little bit also, oh, like that already. So it comes to a, a time when suddenly it happens, I angry and I cannot control my anger. And I shall, oh, and she don't have no idea what's happening. You know? Don't know that it has happened for the last five years. <laughs> But the problem got so big, cannot solve. And she's trying to figure out, what is this guy talking about? What? What? And so, so I have to tell back issue after issue. It's like, wow, so long. That's the problem with not dealing with problems immediately. Because in our culture, we don't. Right? In our culture, I get mara. You know, I get angry. After a while, you belanja makan. Settle, happy ever after, right? You belanja makan, it's all settled. But cannot. In the culture of the Bible, a community of God cannot live like that. And that's why we need to make sure we stay and not stray. Sometimes it's easier to run away. Run away from problems. Run away from people. We can give all the good excuses. Let me, let me tell you out of experience, this is not the Bible, but out of experience, if you run away from your problem, you can go to different places, the problem repeats itself. You will notice that if a girl has bad boyfriend, terrible boyfriend, and never deal with it, change boyfriend, the next boyfriend is same, terrible. Then the problem after that, same. If a person goes to work in a company, bad boss, Go to the next company, bad boss again. Because God allows circumstances in our life to help us grow and change. You run away from one problem, the problem is not solved. God in His mercy will give you the same problem again. Hallelujah. <laughs> but you will notice, when you give counseling, you will notice that people have repeated problems in different format. But it's at the core of it, it's the same. They, then they will come to a point where, why everybody got good boyfriend? I never had good boyfriend. Because the problem is with you. Why everybody got good job, good pay, good boss? I don't have. Because the problem is with you. And problems repeat. Oh, I shouted so loud. No more sound. <laughs> Raymond telling me to chill, you know, chill, bro, right? And so we need to learn to stay back. You know? Even if it's terrible, let's stay. Don't run away. Don't run away. Uh, it might take some effort on our side, but I encourage all of us, let's stay back. Stay in your group. Stay with your friends. Talk it out. Learn through it. Grow through it. If it takes longer, give yourself time. Pain, it's okay. Give yourself time. Grow through it. And some of you in your mind is thinking, what about my problem that I hide 30 years ago until now? May the Lord's grace be upon you. <laughs> but sooner or later, you need to deal with that issue. It can be a problem that you have kept for 30 years with somebody that never knew about it and close to you. 
but sooner or later we need to talk about it. If you want to know how to talk about it, join Alpha Parenting, Alpha Marriage course, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but real, real. The first time I learned how to talk to Salome is because in Alpha Marriage, they gave us time to talk. I'm like, issue? No issue. Perfect marriage. <laughs> Cannot think of any issue. Only can think of when the agitation comes. Huh? No problem. Got fight before? No. All under the carpet. We got fight, right? Perfect. Everything is not, until you trip on your, <laughs> the things too big already, then you've got problem. But when Salome raised issues, I'm like, oh, I'm not happy already. But we, we learn through it. Um, I am still learning through it. I still find it hard, okay? I still find it hard. But I thank God that I managed to learn earlier. I still wish that I learned even earlier still when I was a youth, but well, better late than sorry, right? Okay, let's move on. Next slide. Now, the third point is this. In a community of God, we can all contribute. You see, sometimes we expect our leaders to do all the comforting and encouragement, counsel and nurture, rebuild and admonish, serve and minister. These are leadership jobs, right? Of course, I say they're wrong, but right? Sometimes we feel that. Isn't the leader supposed to comfort and encourage? Isn't the leader supposed to counsel and nurture? You mean, no, no. The job of comfort and encourage is the congregational responsibility. The job of counseling and nurturing is again a congregational responsibility. Rebuking and admonish. Wow, this one a bit shocking. When somebody sins in church, who is supposed to rebuke them? Everyone says, Pastor, right? I, I say pastor all the time until I read the Bible. The Bible tells me the person who sees a, sin, a sinning brother, tell him quietly in secret. When a brother sins against you, whose responsibility to tell the brother? You. Who has the highest authority for church discipline in church? Is it pastors? No. The church, the congregation. Then what does a pastor do? Okay, a leader's lead, feed, protect. Now, should leaders do this? Absolutely. Why? Because leaders are members of the church. Leaders should do this because they are members of the congregation. But these are responsibilities of everyone in church. That's why there is a list of verses with the word one another. Love one another. Serve one another. Because a lot of times, what we expect the leaders to do, they should do, the things we expect the leaders of to do is actually all our responsibilities. Sometimes we think only pastors can teach. But the Bible says, teach one another. Sometimes we think only the leaders can serve and be ministers. That's why the leaders in church must go through a theological school for four years, training for another two years, then they come out, they can be ministers, they are ordained. But the Bible says that everyone must serve. Let me read two, I'm just going to read two briefly, a long list, which I got on the internet in the PDF, of verses that starts, that has the word one another. Next slide, okay? I'm just going to read through. The one another passages, right? It occurs 100 times in the New Testament, approximately 59 times of those occurrence are specific. Why is it important? Because this one another, this congregational, this community culture forms the basic of what we call the Christian community in, within the church, what we call the church today. All right. So this is not exhaustive. These are some verses. I just took it online. Let me just read through, okay? It says, care for one another. So who cares? All of us. Uh, it says, admonish one another. Who rebuke? All of us. Sometimes other people rebuke us. We say, you're not my, not my pastor. You have no right. No, they do have the right. 
if they are your community member, if they are part of your family of the community, they have the right to rebuke you. But rebuke correctly, lah. Then you ask them, oh, huh? where's the Bible? Huh? Number three, it says, comfort one another. Whose responsibility to comfort? All of us. It says, encourage one another. Everyone's responsibility. It says, serve one another. All of us. Love one another. This one we know. It says, teach one another. Interesting. It says, submit to one another. We often hear submit to parents, submit to government, submit to parents. But the base of it is we need to first submit to God and submit to one another because we are equals. I told you just now, pastors are just sheep that does the work of a shepherd. We are not shepherds. Uh, be devoted to one another. Wow. Honor one another above yourself. Praise God. This one we know, right? Uh, live in harmony with one another. Build up one another. We always think the church leadership must build us up. No, no, no. We build one another up. Who has the... Let me sidetrack first. In a family, a husband needs to build the wife up. Need to nurture the wife. Sometimes a husband says, Oh, yeah, my wife terrible. I'm not spiritual at all. It's a husband's responsibility. And sometimes we feel the children are terrible. I send them to Sunday school. Or the Sunday school teacher will teach them. No, 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 no. It's a parent's, husband and wife's responsibility. I continue on. It says, be like-minded toward one another. Accept. Accept one another. Accept means we are different. We have different gifts. We have different motivations. That's why we are different. Accept. We accept means that we enjoy one another, not endure one another. Because sometimes we really endure one another for life. It's okay. I understand it happens. But let's slowly fix it. There are certain people I endure. <laughs> There are certain people you endure too, yes? Oh, now I feel terrible. Yeah? yeah. Certain people you just oh, cannot accept, you know? They are having weird mindset, weird style, weird perspective, weird lifestyle, everything weird about them. Oh, you endure. But the Bible says you need to accept. You need to enjoy the differences. Can you enjoy the differences? Yeah, sometimes we instinctively know to enjoy differences. That's why your husband and your wife is so different from you. I'm looking at Andrew and Vun now, right? Because they're getting married next month. So different. Right? They like differences. Accept one another. Love, lah, huh? love, love. That's why you say love is blind. No? So different from one another, right? Um, I take that back. Love is not blind, by the way. Uh, number Next one is greet one another. Wow. This one's so easy, lah. Sunday service we always do. Obey one another's burden. This one very hard. When other people got burden, we bear them. Wow. The context is Galatians chapter 6. Huh? Galatians chapter 6 is talking about fruit of the spirit, the works of flesh, and the problems of sin. And it says, bear one another's problem. If your brother sin, after you rebuke them, bear and walk with them until they overcome. Wow, that's bear one another's problem. Forgive one another, praise the Lord. Are there people we cannot forgive? Oh, some people just hard to forgive, especially when they repeat, right? First time harm me, never mind. Second time harm me, ayaya. Right? What, what's, the, what's the proverb? Cheat me once, shame on you. Cheat me twice, shame on me, right? But the Bible different. Forgive them one time, come again, forgive again. Come. How many times? 70 times, 7 times, 490 times, very little bit, no problem, can. Until you find out, Jesus don't mean mathematical, numerical, 490 times. It means perfection. It means always forgive. Wow. Okay, moving on. Uh, be patient with one another. We, okay, lah. speak the truth in love. Half of us can speak the truth, no love. Half of us got love, cannot speak the truth. We just need to learn from one another and speak the truth in love, right? Yeah? So the half of you that can speak truth, you need to learn more love. The half of you that need, got love, time to open your mouth, right? Don't sit on the carpet. <laughs> Be kind and compassionate to one another. Uh, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Not, not just with language, you can sing to one another. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah? 
Yeah. Right, next, moving on. Uh, consider others. I thought I read this already. Consider others better than yourself. Uh, look to the interests of one another. Not just self-interest, but interest of one another. Wow. So sacrificial. Bear it again. Bear with one another. Okay, different context. This is Colossians 3. Exhort, exhort means strengthen, encourage one another. Stir up one another to love and good works. Hebrews 10. Okay, this stir is the word provoke. Uh, it means to make them, provoke them like, huh? You do, uh, I also want to do. Uh. Okay, that's stir up. Uh. Huh? You give food to the poor, I also want to give food to the poor. Instead of saying selfish stirring, this is giving. Uh. Uh, show hospitality to one another. This one, we got a lot of people in LBC. Fantastic. Uh, but moving on. Employ the gifts that God has given us for the benefit of one another. You have gifts. Some of you can teach. Some of you can counsel. Some of you can sing. Some of you can encourage. Some of you give of mercy, love going hospital. Some of you got gifts of caring chairs. Some of you gifts of cooking. Whatever gifts you have, use it for the benefit of one another. Uh, clothe yourself with humility towards one another. This one, Asian, very good. Of course, we practice fake humility. <laughs> But we need to go the uh, that one different extreme. Uh, false humility is when you try to be humble so that person praise you more, right? Yeah, we do <laughs> we do that often all, all, all the time. Okay, pray for one another, confess your faults to one another. Wow. Do you see that? Sometimes we always say, okay, confess before God your sin, right? Ask for forgiveness from God. But there's also a part where you need to confess your sin to a brother because only then. Can they walk with you, journey with you? Right? If they don't know what your problem is, what your struggle, they cannot walk with you. So you need a closer friend. Cannot come on stage and share your stories here. Huh? Uh, we will be like, <gasps> we will too shocked to know what to do. But in a smaller group, that's why character group is my desire. My hope that your small group will grow so closely together that you begin to love one another you love one another differences, you begin to like and trust one another that you are willing to share some of your faults. Maybe you test with number 10, not the first lah. And you test out. And you see how they respond to you, how they work with you, then you overcome your problem. Oh, then you can try next. Oh. I hope this next time, it will be an accountability group, a group of support. And I hope that your family will become like that too, an individual small family unit. All right, let's move on. A negative commands, what not to do. Do not lie to one another, yeah? not judge one another. The word judge here is the Romans 14 one. It's talking about uh, jumping to conclusions. Sometimes we do, right? Means What it means is we need to find out. Find out. Let's go talk. Talk about it. Uh, if you keep on biting each other, you'll be... Destroyed. Okay, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Just now says provoke one another. Now it says don't provoke one another. Context, ah, context. Just now it's provoke one another to good works. This is don't suka suka provoke one another. It's like father, don't provoke your children. Sometimes father love to provoke your children, right? Sengaja make them angry. Let's not be so evil. <laughs> And make people sengaja make them angry. Let's not, okay? Uh, do not slander one another. Do not grumble against one another. I think I finished the list, yes? Wow, what a long list. But this is an opportunity. All this, all of us can do. But you will think in your mind, what if I do wrong? I cannot do it well. What if I try, uh, and because I never done it before, uh, I do a terrible job of it. Ah, yeah, yeah. Don't want to do it again. Ah. Never mind. Your group will accept you and your weaknesses so you can do it again. Right? Sometimes our friends, when they first learn to use the gifting, quite bad at it, right? People who can give counseling when they first started, they give condemnation. Ah, yeah, you go to hell like you, you cannot work like you, you know? We, we, we don't know, we haven't learned. Sometimes people try to speak the truth, not much love. Give them time. Give them time to develop love, right? So we are all growing, we are all in a community together. And that's why I'm talking about this image today. The importance 
of living within a community of God. The reason that I'm very concerned is I have heard people say, I can be a Christian without anybody in the world knows that I'm Christian and I'm still a Christian. Yes, you can accept Jesus Christ, keep quiet your whole life, you're still a Christian, you'll still go heaven. Yes. But that's, what, that's not what the plan of God is for our life. God does not want us to live a solitude life. You know, there were seasons where Christianity becomes so, so exclusive. People except Christ have to go to monasteries and hide themselves in a room and pray. While that's great, that's great because we want to spend time with God. But not at the expense of detaching ourselves away from communities. We need friends. Christians should not only meet on Sunday. We need to have times to enjoy one another other days. Doesn't mean we only come for prayer meeting. Lah. I'm saying you come for fellowship at home. Have a meal together. I'm saying you go for holiday together. I'm saying you go call up one another, message one another. I'm saying you ask about one another or asking one another. Mark is great in asking questions, right? We need to learn some like that. Ask questions of one another. How are you today? And that's what we say, community. Is community important? We know it is. Because when we first join a group, we are so blessed. Right? When we first join a cell group, wow, so good. Oh. We need that. But it's hard to maintain that. Because after a while, you forget you need that. We forget we need that community, but we need that community. So what happens when you don't need a community? Very easy. During that time, somebody needs you. Let me repeat that. What happens, certain time of your life, you actually feel you don't need a community. During those times, somebody in that community needs you. There are times when we join a community so they will receive help, but there will be times when we join a community to provide help. It must be give and take. Give and receive. Give is good. Receive is good too. Because if you don't receive, the other guy cannot give. Right? I struggle with receiving because I feel humiliated. My dad can receive so happily, you know, both my dad. You know, Pastor Chin was receiving something and he was like, wow, thank you. I'm like, so next time I also want to do the expression, expression you know, when somebody gives, wow, thank you, even though I feel slightly humiliated, but it helps the person who gives feel good about themselves. Ma. I'm like, yeah, ho, never thought of it that way. Let's give and receive. Amen? This community. Everybody say community. Okay, next slide. I'm, I'm talking too much today. So how can we contribute? Uh, we can contribute during Sunday service. We can talk to one another. We can contribute in a small group, in character group. If you don't have a group and you're interested, let me know. Let's find one for you. Let's find one that's suitable. Uh, we are not talking about the cell group of the 5W method. Okay, come here, must do this, do this, do this, do this, and then report, report. No, 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 no. We are talking about let's build a community, a smaller community for you. For those few groups that just started, it was good, right? It was good. I enjoyed it. For me, I started a family Sabbath two years ago. It was good. I love it. Uh, some of you can have a circles of passion. What's your gifting? Uh, we have now uh, different circles of passion. We got the cherished group. We got the kindergarten. We got the teens. Yesterday, we first started a teen circle of passion. We hope that you'll do well. Uh, Samuel, where's Samuel? Somewhere there. Uh, we hope that we can able to, and Mac there too, yeah, to reach out to teenagers in schools. But I'm mixing Chinese English, lah, so it's not a youth fellowship. It is, lah, but it's slightly different, okay? So it's a circles of passion. We yearn to reach out to them. But you can also serve in NGOs, Christian NGOs. Uh, Non-Christian also can, but I'm calling it Christian NGOs today because you need the community, the flock of God. 
serve together, serve the community together. I, I don't know how many of these symbols, uh, logos you can identify. Some of your groups one are there too. There are quite a number of them you see. You understand? You can join. Join some NGOs to serve, to, to connect with the members, do the work of God together. All right, next slide. Now, what's the difference? Oh, I had this. So in conclusion, the three things, we follow Christ Jesus, we live in a community, we can contribute. Next. Now, what's the difference? See, last week, we are talking about family of God. You can be an individual wherever you are and you are still family. Because sometimes people in another country, when they become Christian, they cannot tell anybody if not they die. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, are they family? Absolutely. But in places that we can gather, should we not gather? Absolutely. Why? Because we are not just family. We are a community. Next slide. As the family of God, we are believers. As long as we believe, we are family. No matter where, no matter how, no matter how old, as long as we believe, we are a member of family. Because we are all saved by grace through faith, because we all believe in Jesus Christ. And so we are a family of faith. Are there family that's not the same faith? No. Only believers are family. Only believers are family. Believers of different denominations, absolutely, they are family. And we are inclusive. It means that anybody can believe in Jesus. We will preach the gospel everywhere. Is there a tribe that God will never accept? Is there a gender? Oh, obviously not. Lah, huh? But we belong in this family because we believe. And we want in LBC, we value every member of the family. Next slide. But as the flock of Jesus, we are talking about followers. I have decided to follow Jesus. Now, we want to follow Jesus. We follow God in a community. I can believe God as an individual, but I follow and obey Him in a community. For example, love one another. How do you obey that if you've got no one another to love? Serve one another. How to obey that if you don't have somebody to serve? A lot of the Word of God is in the context of a community. You cannot follow and obey unless you survive, not survive. Unless you thrive within a community. And within this community, we strive to do what? To encourage, to champion. Champion means we accept the differences, we accept their gifting, and we champion their gifting and their callings. They are different. We celebrate them, and we honor one another. Because in God's eyes, we are all valuable. And so loving people comes from the overflowing of our love for God. As an individual, I believe God. It's very important. I need to have intimacy with God. I need to spend time with God. I need to read my Bible. I need to pray. I need to, you know, worship God. I need to have time with God. But out of that relationship with God must outflow into our behavior. The way I treat others around me. And that's what the community is all about. And I, I, I'm very glad Albert C., is a strong church when it comes to this picture. Uh, actually, I didn't have a need to preach on this at all. But since I wanted to talk in a, in a greater picture to see the differences, I felt that I just need to preach on this. That's why you don't see us, you don't hear this topic a lot. Because LBC, all of you guys are great. I know because during MCO, times when we cannot meet together as a church, you all visit one another. You all bring pots of flowers. You all bring food. You all bring drinks. You all visit one another. And that's community. Community is not only seen on Sunday. Community is seen on other days. And I see you all go yam cha with one another. And I see you all help one another in, in bad times. I see you all counsel and advice. Those are exactly what this picture is about. You are already doing all this. My encouragement is keep on. Keep it up. May we all continue to be a community that follow Christ together. Amen? Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that you are our good shepherd. 
Father, we thank you that you are our chief shepherd and we thank you for leaders in the church that does the work of shepherds. But Lord, we also thank you that as sheep of the same flock, we can shepherd one another. We can nurture one another. We can love one another. May this community in Likas Baptist Church thrive as a family, not just acknowledging each other as family, but treating one another as a family within this community. May we encourage, champion, celebrate, and honour one another in Likas Baptist Church. May we learn to respond. May we learn to share our life in vulnerability. May we learn to be open and imitate one another, both our strength and our weakness. May it be lessons to us. May we be able to stay, make a commitment to say we are a community and we stay in times of trouble. May we not run away in the first sight of trouble. May we stay so that others can journey with us in overcoming our weakness. So we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.